Good evening. Welcome along. Inspire and be inspired. It's another of our wonderful conversations with incredibly inspirational people. Uh, today, they don't come much bigger and much more inspirational than Mr. Jeff Young. Uh, it's going to be my pleasure to bring him onto the screen. And I'll always begin by saying to everybody coming back and checking out the recording, please make sure that you say hello. I am getting a feedback from somewhere. That's not from you, is it? Is that from me? Let me just double check this and make sure what's going on. Could it be from me? No, I think it's me. Right. Okay. There you go. There we uh, go. So... Let me press this button and bring Jeff onto the screen. How are you, sir? You okay? I'm very good. How are you? I'm really good. So uh, in true style, I can make all of the plans possible beforehand to make it flow as seamlessly as possible. And then I leave a window open and I'm getting a double step okay. back. But we've got that out of the way. So I'll just okay. repeat again, if I may, spend uh, just 30 seconds reminding everybody, anybody that's with me live, please feel free to leave any comments or make any um, discussion about the, the, you know, the, the topics that we bring up. And of course, anybody coming back and checking out the recording, I implore you to let Jeff know uh, what you think of him and how important he has been <laughs> in your life. So I'm going to lay on thick, Jeff. I am going to lay okay. on thick, my friend, okay. because, uh, you know, I have had the pleasure of meeting you on more than one or two occasions. And I've, I'm fairly certain I said from the very beginning how uh, how happy I was to meet you and how honoured I was to meet you, how important you were to my music journey. And I think I uh, echo the sentiments of the whole of the UK uh, in that. So um, if you will allow me to lay it on slightly thick for you, but I know you, you've got broad shoulders and a very humble person. How do you feel when people give you such uh, praise? Well, first of all, you know, that's obviously very, very kind of you. And, and it is very, very uh, flattering to get that kind of praise. Um, I think at the time, particularly with the Radio 1 show, I was doing, I thought I was just doing a job. And it took a long time for me to realise the kind of impact that I was having, particularly around the UK, probably not London because, you know, there were a lot of things going on in London where people could get their music and whatever. And of course, Radio 1 never had a great relationship with London. It wasn't hip enough. Um, but around the rest of the country, yeah, I I, um, I was really proud of what, what the show achieved and the impact that it had. Right. Okay. Well, we are getting way ahead of ourselves by mentioning Radio 1. So let's roll it back. Uh, I have just jumped straight into it because I'm fairly certain there aren't many people who really need me to introduce yourself. We are hoping to find one or two bits of detail that uh, you may have never shared before. That is my goal. We want to um, find out a little bit more about the men behind the music and the women, of course. So let's yeah. let's roll it back. Tell us about life for yourself um, how far would you like to go back? Where do you believe is an, Im an important part uh, of your childhood, maybe? Tell us about family, brothers or sisters, life on the streets. Yeah, I've got, I've got I, well, first of all, I grew up around uh, Welling and Bexley Heath. Uh, my parents um, moved there when I was two years old. And um, my, my first primary school and secondary school were in sort of the Welling area. Uh, I've got a brother who's uh, four years younger than me. And um, it was uh, it, it was good times. I, I really, really enjoyed school. I know a lot of people don't have a chance to say that, but um, I was fortunate enough to go to a school where the spirit amongst all the pupils there of all ages was really good. Everybody got on really, really well. And it was quite an enjoyable experience for me. Um, so that was great. Although uh, when I got to the end of my secondary school, um, I... I decided I definitely wasn't going to university. I had all, all my friends were filling in UCA forms and, you know, going off around the country. But um, I was done with further education, really. I was, I was, I was, how can I put this? I was just done with studying, really, and I wanted to go to work. Okay. Um, so before work so was on, before work was on the horizon, let's find out yeah. about a, a younger Jeff. What what was okay, what were well, your interests? What what uh, were you from a, a well-to-do family? Was life tough growing no, up? No, no, not really. You know, my dad was um uh, was a clerk, an admin guy uh, for British Steel. Okay, and um, 
you know, he did he did well for us, um, but we certainly, you know, weren't rolling in dosh. We weren't clearing off abroad every 10 minutes or anything like that. Um, but, yeah, we were okay. We, we were definitely okay. Mm-hmm. Um, musically, I, I think I remember around the age of eight getting involved in enjoying music, pop, um, looking at pop papers, magazines and stuff, and that went through into my secondary school. And in those teenage years, I was really into, um, into rock and maybe progressive stuff. Okay. Um, by rock, um, I was into the more blues-based rock, which I never realised until later on. So I liked Hendrix, The Stones, um, uh, Led Zeppelin, that kind of stuff. I never was into the whole kind of deep purple Black Sabbath thing, never got that at all. And then later on, I look back and go, Christ, that was all the blues thing. So there was a kind of a black music thing hovering there. Um, then when I was 17, I did discover black music. It was like all about Robbie and Greg on the radio and starting up gigs and going to gigs. And um, and that was where the whole black music thing developed for me. Okay, um, so starting up gigs. Um, yeah. Buying the equipment yourself because it was very much mobile based then. Right? <clears throat> yeah. I mean, when I was 17 and still at school, I partnered with a guy and we used to do um, a youth club on a Sunday night. And the gear was provided by a friend of ours. And um, that continued for quite some time until at the end of that school year when we all left, my partner went off to Liverpool University. And I was kind of left there with my mate who had the gear and then a car. And so I kind of embarked basically on the wedding circuit. I did weddings and we would, uh, we, we progressed with more and more and more gear. I ended up with a small little roadshow thing. And, um, and yeah, we, we, we did okay with that. Uh, we had some laughs along the way, carting this gear around. Uh, and then, uh, I started to do gigs of my own um, at a couple of venues. Um, the more tougher soul gig that you would have seen at the Gold Mine or maybe the Golden Lion in Sydney where Robbie Vincent was playing at the time or anyone who was trying to do a soul gig in a in a pub. I was playing um, in the, the bar room at a football club on a Friday night. Okay. And uh, that did pretty well. You know, it was a big local thing, especially for those kids that were tuned into that soul thing. Um and um, you know that did well, and then, and th- and that in turn developed into me um, supporting Robbie Vincent at a couple of places, and I think he liked what I did, so he started carting me around as his support guy with the sound system, and then of course they talk, and all of a sudden I'm working with Chris Hill and Greg Edwards, and um, I, I just began to progress from there as a DJ. Mm-hmm. So they would have been your your peers, so to speak. Anyone else yeah. outside outside of that circle that you would have had on your radar that you looked up to? Not not at that particular time because that was still the early days of, of everything kicking off. It wasn't until, um, to be honest, Robbie uh, got me the gig at the Royalty in Southgate. Um, the guy, uh, I forget his surname now, I'm sure it was Dave something or other, um, he decided he was leaving and Robbie put me up for the gig. And at that point, I began to um, work with the likes of Froggy. I kind of knew Tom Holland and and that whole kind of in inverted commas Soul Mafia group kind of came about. We all started to play each other's gigs. And so as I travelled around doing things, I got to know more and more of the guys that then became quite a big part of my life later on. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. And um, so whilst doing all these gigs, you were, you were making it, what would you have said your, your strength was back then? Oh, well, my strength, okay. The, I think the reason I ended up being in the position I was is because particularly when I worked with Robbie uh, in the early days, before I'd worked with anybody else, I think he quickly realised that um, he could put me on before he went on and I could uh, fill a dance floor for an hour to 90 minutes, but I wouldn't burn any of the big new tunes in that time. I had a knack. So you're very respectful. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And because, you know, a lot of these guys later on would tell me, oh, man, you know, I went to so-and-so club, the geezer before me, played all the big ones before I went on, you know. And 
but I could do that. I could miraculously while away an hour and a half and have a full dance floor and, you know, not waste anything for the guy who was top of the bill. And so I think, you know, they spoke to each other. They said, you want to work with him? He's a dream, you know, yeah. so... All that so tell, kind of tell thing. me about your ammunition. Where where were you getting where were you getting the music from? Oh, okay. Well, um, to be honest, it was um the uh, the main shop in London at the time was the um oh the cool tempo shop. Okay. Uh the one in Hamway Street. Uh and then it moved to a, a different place. But then later on, of course, um more and more shops sort of came online and in a, in any given week, you might go to City Sounds, Bluebird, Groove Records. Um, eventually, um, Cool Tempo closed down, I think. But there will be three or four of the guys in Berwick Street uh, turned up. So there were three or four shops a week you might go to looking for stuff. Um, so there were plenty of plenty of outlets in those days. Okay. So uh, I think with the timeline, I think we're still talking around... 1718 or, or we've gone forward a few years. Well, yeah, maybe maybe early 20s now. Okay. You know, so 21 t- so, 22. So you had said then that you university was not for you. So how were yeah. you earning your money? Did you get a full-time job? Ah, uh, well, I did get a full-time job and um when I was a kid I was um I had hay fever. Quite bad hay fever. Like June was just the month from hell for me. Uh, thankfully I grew out of it as as time went on. And uh, I used to have to go to tests at um, St. Mary's in Paddington. And uh, where they did these tests, there was a door to a laboratory and it had like a porthole window in the door. And I'm kind of looking through this window going, hmm, this is kind of interesting. And um, I did science A-levels. And so what I did, I, I, um, I applied for a job at St. Thomas's Hospital, uh, which is the one opposite the Houses of Parliament. Okay. And... Um, Miraculously, they gave me a job. I ended up um, working in the Department of Clinical Chemistry. I was basically a clinical chemist. Wow. And um, I've met and a few I, of those, Danny. Yes. Yeah, well, you know what? And I absolutely loved it. It was great. I was, I'm not just saying it, I was really good at the job. Um, I used to do on call stuff where they'd leave you alone and you'd be there all night working with the on call doctors, doing stuff, emergencies, whatever, whatever. And um, the only problem with it is the bit like now, the pay was shocking. And um, I actually did it for eight years. I got to 26 and I thought, I just can't, I can't do this. And I played in a Sunday football team and half of the guys in the team worked in a Boutique, a bunch of uh, a bunch of boutiques called Take Six, which were around in those days. They eventually ended up being owned by Burtons, okay. and also by the age of twenty six, of course, we were doing Caster and all kinds of quite big events. And so I got to know quite a few record company people, and it got to the point where I was either going to go and sell trousers with my mates or get a job in a record company. And thankfully, the record company thing showed up just at the right time. So, so that was that. I really had to leave the NHS. I couldn't, I couldn't work for that money. It was you, just you murder. Weren't, it wasn't affording you enough imports. Uh, no, no. I, well, thankfully, <laughs> I was doing enough gigs to pay for the records. But uh, yeah, I mean, without the gigs, I wouldn't have been buying the records on that money. No way. Right. No okay. Way. So before we continue uh, again, I like to make this as interactive as I can. I want to say yeah. hi to DJ P, who's watching. He sends his regards to you. Thank you. DJ Cheers. P says hi, uh, as does Damien Squire, Emily, okay. Jimmy Mack. Thank you yeah. for passing through. Um, okay, then. So uh, the record company, the record label. Okay, the record label. Um, the, the record label I first worked for was Phonogram. It was part of the what was then the Polygram Group, which was Phonogram, um, Polydor, and London Records, Stroke Decca Records. Um, and Phonogram eventually became Mercury way, way further down the line and stuff. Um, and it was a it was a major record company. It was a major record company in the days when there were about eight majors. Mm-hmm. So you had Phonogram, Polydor, um, London, A and M, Sony, Warner's, you know, all the all the usual suspects, but Ireland. Um, and we were one of the majors. So we had a vast um, roster of artists from all genres. As the as the majors did, so I went in doing club promotion, and 
uh, as well as working on Cameo, Cool and the Gang, whoever. Um, I was working ABC, Tears for Fears, Soft Cell, and um, it was Just, it was When you really say good. club promotion, get, getting the product out to the jobs? Yeah, getting the product out to people, trying to persuade people to play it. And part of the gig was as well was um, – a local radio thing, you know, I was in touch with a lot of guys that had one-off shows on various local radio stations, whether it be alternative shows where they could play Tears for Fears or whether it was um, uh, black music shows where they could be playing Cameo or Cashflow or whoever it might be, you know. Mm -hmm. So that was part of the the brief. Okay, I get you. So, and um, on that way, were you ever having to chaperone any of the artists that came over? Did you ever yeah. get uh, talked into yeah. doing that as well? I was at Phonogram for two weeks and they sent me on tour with Cool in the Gang. Mm. And it was like, oh, this is interesting. I mean, this is before mobile phones and all these kind of things. And you're on the road with 10 black Americans and, you know, they would ask for some pretty interesting things when you're out on the road. And it was a, it was a pretty quick education. And um, after most of the shows, we would clear off to some club somewhere. You know, I'd find a club open in the town, whether it was Manchester, Liverpool, and we would all go there. Um, I did a tour with the Gap Band, did a tour with, um, obviously, Cameo. Uh, I toured with Cool a few times because they came in every year. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and they so were great. They were great we, at no point have we really um, put a, a time stamp on this. So kind of yeah. give me a year. So I'm roughly. 26 now. I'm okay. 26, and this would have been around 1981, 82. Okay. Um, so, yeah, that's when, that's when it all kicked off. I went to Phonogram in October 81. That was when it all started, the record company thing. Uh-huh. Um, so t- what about, t- if you can, very probably a big ask, paint a picture of the, the, the UK landscape that immediately springs to mind back then, musically speaking, um, because we're still okay. coming out of the back end of the, we're just getting into the new romantic S kind of yeah. on the gen, yeah. on the, the landscape for on the wider but, scale. Right. Yeah, a- absolutely. So let's cover that new romantic angle first. Um, in those early days at Phonogram 81, 82, when I was going out there trying to persuade people to get involved with, Tears for Fears or Bill Nelson or whoever it was, you know, the big acts, particularly in those student nights, for example, were Japan, Human League, uh, ABC, Soft Cell. It was it was all that kind of stuff. And that that's really where the priority of the record company lay. And so an act like Call in the Game Cameo would get a lot of attention, but some of the other acts might not. So you used to have to work quite hard to, you know, push those acts and get them in a position where they could chart. And the other thing that was going on, of course, was Radio 1. Radio 1's priority wasn't necessarily uh, black dance music. So what kind of would happen is I would see big records that I went, that I knew were huge on the soul scene suddenly go careering in the charts at 18. Um, but obviously our scene was so big, it actually had more power than people realised. And um, people at Radio 1 would go, oh, Christ, where did that come from? You know, it's like, well, actually, it's bloody massive out there. Um, and, and so I found that um, our records, what I would call our records, charted by the the sheer um, power of the clubs and the people in those clubs who subscribed to the music and went out and bought it. Um, and again, in those days, quite a few of the imports took ages to come out in the UK, but there were still enough people who hadn't shelled out for import who later on would still buy a UK copy and chart the act. Okay. So, yeah, it was... It, it was it was good. You ended up in the chart, but it was down a different road from the other the other acts. Would there be a very specific record that you may be able to cite as a turning point that changed the game? Is there anything like that that springs to mind, or any act? Uh, any act? Um, I don't know. I think I, I think different records at different times and how they happened. Uh, would mean more, and I couldn't. I couldn't go into all of them by any long stretch of the imagination. But I think. Um, I think the Brit Funk thing was great. Okay. Um, I, I think that was a bit of a game changer. Um, 
And I think that acts like Cameo, purely because of Larry's showmanship, also were slight game changers as well because all of a sudden you've got someone who could go in into Record Mirror and get the front page and even NME later on and stuff like that, you know. And I think um, I think that helped. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I mean, there were a few moments. It, it, rather than one big moment, it was a culmination of moments that actually grew and, and helped progress the whole entity. Okay, yeah. Okay, well, uh, Schooly joins us, Mr. Simon oh, Phillips. He says, good good, good evening. As nice does one, uh, Jason, my good friend from Birmingham. Hello, mate. Nice to hear from you. He says, hi, Andy. Hard to find records would have never been if it, if not for the wonderful Jeff Young. Uh, oh, I, I you think go. you Thank are you. responsible for quite a few pounds being spent <laughs> out there. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, I was always uh, told that. An illustrious career that we uh, is really impossible to cover in, in such a short interview like this. So you know there are going to be uh, bits that we have to skip over. But yeah, so we've okay. got to be getting close to the point where radio is on the horizon for you. Okay. Well, um, I was doing Radio London when I was still working at the hospital, um, so that was a bit of a funny one. But um, when I was at, by the time I was at Phonogram, I think. Uh, at some point, Robbie moved on to Radio 1 and I ended up on Radio London on a weekly basis every Saturday. And um, it was a classic 11.30 till 2 um, slot. And that whole thing of money, you know, all the shops used to say to me, oh, we all knew what you played on Saturday morning because they were all in asking for it on Saturday afternoon. So, um, and people have always said to me, my God, you cost me a lot of money in those days. I'm like, oh, sorry about that, you know, but um, needs must and all that sort of thing. Yeah. That's great. It's a, it's a, it's a brilliant position to be in. And as I say, very, very humble with it as well. So onto, onto London radio. Uh, and yeah. then, and, and at this time, again, just put in, into perspective for my broken mind, uh, actually, let me ask you a question. What is your memory like? Are you quite, are you quite good? Do you take pride in the well, fact that you can remember things? Or Well, I, I can remember some things, but there's always somebody that will come up to me and say something, and I'm just like, I haven't got a clue. It's like I wasn't there. Mm. Um, and I think, um, I think part of it was is that we were doing it, and it was, it was our job. And like I said earlier, I, I'm not sure until later on we realised what effect we were all having on people. And one of the things I do regret is this whole thing of photography. You know, I, I, I so wish I had more pictures. And, um, you know, I know there are loads out there. But, yeah, I wish I had more pictures of interviewing Al Jarreau and Donald Byrd and all these kind of characters at Radio London, for example. Uh-huh. Uh, and even at Radio One when I was doing... Ice T and Public Enemy and whoever you know, whoever I agree to talk to. I, I wish there was some more of that. Well, that uh, will, for that sure. will bring me perfectly onto what I was just about to say from from my uh, broken mind, knowing very well of the time frame that we're on now. We start talking about the you know the the hip hop and the the uh, yeah. break dance and and that kind of explosion in the UK, which I think you yeah. had a very big hand in. In, in making it happen, right? A, a little bit, yeah. I, I say a little bit because um, in those early days of electro, um, I wasn't really um, sufficiently into that stuff to want to play it in a club. I think we were still, I say, when I say we, the group of us that were still working together, we were still playing much more of a soulful um, type of music in club land. Although, of course, when I was at the record company, that's a different matter. Mm-hmm. So uh, I think it was 86 or 85, I signed Shannon, for example, yeah. um, which I never played in a club, but I signed it for my record label because I thought it was a hit, and it was. Uh, and we got we had three hits with her and, and sold a ton of albums, which I was, you know, very, very pleased about. Uh, but that's something I, I did. I skipped around genres at work, but I didn't do that so much on my radio show and in clubs. So, for example, um, I went into A&R around 83. In the period I was in A&R at Phonogram, I worked with um, Kevin Rowland, ABC, 
I worked a bit with Was Not Was. Um, and then I worked with the the black artists that we had on the label as well. So, you know, I was dodging around genres because of my background, you know, because I didn't just have black music up there. I had all kinds of other things in there, mainly from my teenage years. I could handle and enjoy these other genres and therefore I got involved with them and, and some of the artists. So, um, but later on, yeah, particularly with hip hop, I, I loved uh, hip hop, uh, embraced it, played it in clubs, played it on the radio. Um, and yeah, definitely helped that genre along, much to the chagrin of some people who thought I should still be playing soul music. But, you know, well, that's I, another I story. Say, I have spoken yeah. to my, my good friends here in Birmingham, responsible for example, the powerhouse or Dayas, And we talked about the changing of the guard where the soul scene was slowly getting pushed aside with the electro, the hip hop, and then eventually, yeah. you know, the, the, the beginnings of the house scene, but before the house scene even came along, the, the, the soul or day as we're changing with the, yeah. you know, the, the, the electro sound and the hip hop, so to speak. So what was it about it that, that you that lit a spark in yourself? I just, I just uh, love it. Well, okay. I should, I should go back a bit. Actually, I kind of um, thought I liked hip hop. Uh, as, as I said, I wasn't quite sure about electro, but then when I signed Shannon, we had to go to New York to shoot a video and it was the first time I'd been there and within a day, everything made sense. Just traveling around the city, listening to the radio, the penny dropped and it's like, ah, uh, I get it now. And I, I obviously, I personally needed to, to see where it came from and what it meant to the city and everything else before I got it myself. Mm -hmm. And so after that, uh, I played more of it on my radio shows played more of it at gigs, plus the fact, you know, there were a bunch of young guns coming up behind me and Vincent and Hill who were doing more of that stuff. You know, you got Johnny Walker, you got Oakenfold, you got uh, even Tong and Nicky Holloway and all these guys that were doing the big events that we were doing, but they were doing a younger, fresher thing. And um, that, that was when it really kind of, blossomed for us i think mm -hmm. okay and other and by this point then were you starting to be more aware of of people around the country doing the same thing because i've spoken to some you know real legends down the years who were doing their thing up north you were aware that this was you know yeah well as you yeah, say I was, obviously outside of london you were huge as well yeah i was very aware of um the Stu Allens and the Greg Wilsons and um, other guys like them who were pushing boundaries and pushing music forward. Um, and, yeah, and they were an inspiration for me as well because when I was on the road, particularly if it was at the weekend, I'd get a chance to hear them play as well. And, uh, yeah, it was it was really exciting times, really exciting times. How are you on the um, competitive front did you feel that you always had to go out there and, and give your all? Did you feel threatened is probably the wrong word, but was there always that edge of, of competitiveness with yourself or were you such well, a, a tight knit community that that didn't really come into your, your well, thoughts? Okay. I mean, let, let's be perfectly frank here. That Let's talk about say um, the case DJs, you know, we started off as quite a tight knitted group, but towards the end, we weren't a tight knit group because we were all going off in different musical directions. It was like a band splitting up over musical differences. So I, I didn't, I never felt threatened because I just did my thing. I just, you know, if I got asked to play, I would go and play. But the thing about when I played, I made it, um, I made my intention to give people a good night. I was never going to go there, put my head down, just play what I wanted to, piss people off, have them all walking out of the club. No, 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 no. I would always be constant looking around the club, right, how many people like this? Okay, well, let's try this one after. Let's try this one. Got to keep the floor going. That was my thing. I would, uh, yeah, I was I was into giving people a good night, basically. Looking back, I wasn't going to do that selfish thing. Say again. Forgive me. Sorry. Looking back, yeah, sorry. does that um, does that mean that sometimes you compromised with what you wanted to do uh, in yeah, favour of making a good night? Yeah, definitely. I think um, 
in those days, it was quite interesting because, you know, you could go to a club and play four hours of new music, which you can't do now, not not in the places I used to play anyway. But, um, yeah, so it was quite good. But sometimes, you know, you you could you could see what was going on and you couldn't necessarily play all the things you wanted to play because you could see it wasn't going to work for whatever reason. And so sometimes you had to kind of just pull back a little bit and maybe play a bit safe, which, you know, you don't always want to do, but sometimes you have to if you don't want to empty the room, you know. Mm-hmm. But you were, there, you were there to do a job and do a job you would do. Yeah, yeah, mm-hmm. absolutely. Okay, so uh, as we're moving into the, the mid-'80s then and um, Radio 1 – Radio One comes knocking, or you you go to them. Well, again, um, because of the experience of going to New York, um, I did the classic thing. You know, this is obviously pre-computers. I wrote a three-page letter to Johnny Beerling, who was head of Radio One, telling him why I should be on air on Friday or Saturday night. Nice. And um, because I'd sat in for Robbie a few times on Radio 1. There were quite a few producers up there who knew who I was and knew what I was doing. And I think there was a bit of a, a, a bit of ground support for the idea of doing something like that. And basically, I just said to Radio 1, look, you know what, you've got a generation of people in bedrooms and bathrooms getting ready to go out. And the programme you've got on it's, you know, it, it's good, but, it, you know, it shouldn't be there. It should be somewhere else in the in the roster, and you should have a program that does what I can do. And basically, at this particular time, um, indie bands were kind of on the wane a bit. The indie scene wasn't particularly thriving, and most of the great music coming out on indie labels was dance stuff. It was British guys the Mark Moores of this world and all these people doing their own stuff, you know, UK rap acts like MC Duke or whoever, you know, doing this thing. So I wrote to Radio 1 and I heard nothing. So I thought, okay. And then I was approached by Capital. Uh, they they actually came to me and I said, yeah, okay, I'd love to do this. It got to the point where um, I even did a couple of rehearsals up there uh, in their studio uh, but I hadn't signed anything. And then just as I was pretty much about to sign, uh, Radio 1 rang and said, we want to do it. And I was like, well, this is a bit of a dilemma. So, um, <laughs> Do you think they so, got wind? That you yeah, were, you yeah, were... I, yeah. Who knows? I don't know. So um, the next thing was, you know, they said, oh, okay, we're going to do a Friday night. And I'm like, okay. And I said to them, what about medium wave? Because obviously in those days, in 87, Radio One was still on medium wave around the country. And if you've ever heard medium wave at night, this is one for the teenagers, you can't hear it, basically. It's just a load of whistles and fading in and out. It's just a nightmare. And Radio One said to me, well, actually, you're in luck because six weeks after you start, we're going to open up our first FM transmitter. And then between then and Christmas, we're going to roll out FM to the whole of the UK. So I said, I'm coming. And <laughs> I'm so <in. laughs> I'm in. Yeah. So that was that. I think possibly if they'd have said to me, we're stuck with Medium Wave for another two years, I'd have stayed in London and probably gone to Capital. Um, but that's how the Radio One gig came about. And that was that was 87. That was 87. I started in October 87. Beautiful. So um, yeah. from the off, was it the big beat from the off? It was the big beat from the off. Um, I called it the big beat. Um, so it gave me um, the license to jump around genres if I wanted to. I, You know, I've never had a program with a genre-specific name in it in case I wanted to go somewhere else. Okay. And that kind of stops people going, oh, you know, what you're doing? It's called the Fred Blog Soul Show or something, you know, and I'm playing from DMC. So, you know, I always I called it the big beat, and um, it took – until about April of the following year before I thought I'd found my feet and I thought I was getting somewhere and I was beginning to feel that it was working. Um, how? It was a, it, wow. How? Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> the mail. Okay. Um, the people at Radio 1 said, you know, they'd started to get um, a rise in the ratings and it just began to feel good. One thing I learned 
I don't know if, if this is the same for all the radio guys. I don't know if um, uh, Schooley, uh, you know, has this same situation. I found it quite interesting jumping from Radio London to Radio One, and then doing the big beat. I thought it would you could just slide in and just carry on if you see what I mean, but it didn't work like that. All of a sudden, you're on at night instead of in the morning, and it's a Friday, and you're thinking about this atmosphere and this atmosphere, and then you're building a program to do that. And then as I was building the program, I was finding certain things worked at different points. And so by the April, you know, because you only get one chance a week to do it. So you've got to wake another week to have a go, see if that's better, you know. So it took a while before I thought I'd got the flow and it was working properly. Although later on, I did change it. I thought the hip hop that I loved was then breaking up the flow. So I said to the Radio 1 crowd, listen, what I want to do here, I want to play all my hip-hop in the last hour of the show. So I almost ghettoized it off in a way so that I could have more of a flow with the house stuff and everything else that was going on at the time in the first couple of hours. Okay. Um, yeah, yeah, that was how the whole Big Beat thing evolved. Well, my friend Chris uh, is jumping in saying, many fun memories of the Big Beat radio show in his teenage years. He still may have some C60s somewhere. <laughs> uh, as I'm sure many people do, as Tim Moore yeah. says, the Big Beat show was absolutely transformative for me. Such an iconic show. And Schooly yeah. is uh, agreeing with you, saying 100%. Were you flying solo or did you have a producer? Okay, well, um, in, in true Radio 1 style, I did have a producer um, in the very early part of it. Um, but he went off to work on another project. Uh, so I was kind of working on my own for quite some time. And um, although I had um, a lot of contact with the people at base camp at Radio 1, I didn't necessarily talk to the hierarchy that much. Okay. And um, Is it still quite stuffy? For, still quite stuffy back then? It, it, it was. You know, I, I just had a very brief glimpse of what it was like at Capital who are obviously in the commercial arena. And there was much more of a buzz and a fizz about the place than there, there was about Radio 1. Radio 1 was great on another level. You know, you, you're up there and you're mixing with the peels of this world. And, you know, it was, it was, it was really interesting. It, it was a fascinating arena to be in. There's no doubt about it. But, yeah, you know what? They reacted quite slowly to things. That's why I was surprised when I got, given that program because I, th I think I wrote to them in the January and I went on the air in October, which I thought was pretty quick for them. Um, whereas Cabot were like, bang, yes, we've got to do this. Bang, we're going to change that, you know. Mm -hmm. um, but, yeah, I, I didn't have um, a lot of contact with the with the hierarchy there and eventually I went out to lunch with a couple of them and they said, oh, how are you getting on with your producer? And I said, look, I'm not being rude. I haven't spoken to him for six months. <laughs> and they were like, what? And I said, well, he's off doing this Paul McCartney thing, and so I'm just carrying on. I'm just doing what I do. And they were like, oh, we can't have that. And they gave me another producer who who was much better at understanding what I was trying to do and gave me had to do it, and, and he was really, really supportive and helped me with a lot of the acts we got in for interview and stuff. So, yeah, eventually I, I did. But, again, very, very rarely did they come to me and go, are you going to play this or why aren't you playing that or whatever. You know, the musical choice was was absolutely mine. Okay. So two questions, one that's just come into my head. I'm going to jot down. Did you ever feel maybe – uh, not overwhelmed. Was there ever a pressure, a responsibility to deliver the uh, the new music? You know, a huge, a huge fan, a support of the new music. Did you ever? Did it ever get to a point where you were just like, you know, where are we going to go now? I, I don't know. Did you feel the responsibility of the nation on your shoulders? Okay, <laughs> I wouldn't quite. I wouldn't quite put it like that. I, I think you know. I th it was my duty. I, I thought it was my duty to deliver the nation new music anyway. So I never felt any pressure to do it. Um, if anything, there was a little bit of pressure on me to play things that were around, if you see what I mean. Like, you know, a couple of times they said to me, 
you know, can't you play the odd chart record? And I'm like, no, 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 no. I did all that. I did that eight weeks ago. That's that's done. I gave it six weeks. It's charted. I'm off. I'm on to the next thing. You know, I, I can't be doing that. There's too many other things I need to be doing. So, but they were they were cool about that. That was okay. Uh-huh. Um, so I, you, I you've did, broken you've broken more records than you can remember, right? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. I, I mean, there's a Jeff Young Big Beat page on Facebook. And um, people used to say to me, oh, uh, I see your page on Facebook. And this was in the days where I wasn't on it. And I'm like, I'm not on it. What, what are you talking about? And I got one of the girls at work to show me my Facebook page on Facebook. And guys put, and girls, put tracks up on this uh, Facebook page. And I'm looking at the record labels and things, and I'm like, Lord, I don't remember playing that. But... They're in, they all insist, oh, yeah, you played this. Da, 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 da. I'm like, okay, if you say so, that's fine by me. <laughs> yeah, well, our, fr- so- our friend Damien is saying in the background that uh, he, uh, amazing chat, mesmerised by the musical tapestry uh, that Jeff has, and he thought, I had a good collection, but yours is definitely bigger than mine. <laughs> well, I, I commented on that earlier. So tell us yeah. about, we'll get back to the history. Tell us about the yeah. room that you're in. Tell us about well, the, the room. room I mean, is my is my record room? It's on the ground floor of my house. Um, that way is all albums. Uh, that way is all um, albums and books. I've got a. I kept a few twelves. My sevens went a long time ago, and then directly behind me, um, where I cleared out quite a few twelves that I didn't really want anymore. I had the shelves uh, divided again, and they're all wrapped up CDs, um, which which I used particularly for the radio show mm-hmm. um, or the radio shows, whatever they were, you know. So, um, yeah, that's basically the room. There's kind of glimpse, different bits of equipment glimpse. up there. Sorry? I'm sorry, I caught a glimpse of some gold discs on the wall. Oh, yeah, there are. There are some gold discs on the wall. Um, they're, they're a mixture. Uh, they're a mixture of uh, albums that I worked on with various artists, and there are albums uh, where I basically played the records, and the record company said, "Thanks for kicking this off. Here's a disc." So wow. yeah, it's a mi- it's a mixture of stuff. Yeah, beautiful. That will bring me on to what I wanted to write down. You must have had a him- you were- you must have had an influence on the playlist. At sort of oh, Radio event- One eventually. Yeah, you must no. have had a huge influence. No. no. Nothing no. critic, nothing, not even Betty Boo or something. <laughs> no, absolutely not. When I did the year on Capital, they used to listen to some of the things that I was playing and they did playlist some of it, but not, not a Radio One, you know. No. They, but the, the, the kind of, the kind of cool thing that I did at Radio One and yeah. it was when they, you know, they might have listened to me for 10 minutes, I don't know, but occasionally I would open, a producer's door and I would say to him why aren't you playing whatever and it might be a record on Warner Brothers or Sony and they go oh you've got nothing to do with that have you and I'm like no nope, but you should have something to do with it you should be playing that or you should be looking at that and they're like oh okay okay now whether they took any notice of me I don't know some of them did end up getting played on Radio 1 some of them didn't mm-hmm. but that kind of took people by surprise, I think, where I'm talking to them about things I had nothing to do with. You know, they weren't on on the label that I was working for. Okay, <clears throat> with your um, with the progression at Radio One, uh, I only I happen to know personally. Obviously, management get involved then uh, for yourself. Um, yeah. Did that start to expand things for you and more projects uh, become uh, on the horizon, or, or did you just want to focus mainly on the radio show? Okay, well, I had to focus on the radio show because of my work at the record label. You know, I had this dual life where I'm working at record companies. Um, For example, um, I've been on Radio 1 a very, very short period of time, and I finally left Phonogram and went to A&M. So in A&R, and it it was tough keeping up, keeping up with both jobs. So outside projects were almost impossible really um i was you know if i wasn't doing my radio one thing i was working for a and i was you know at it constantly all the time so um it it wasn't possible really i mean i had management for my gigs but 
uh, for no other reason, really. Um, a bit later on down the line, I had people contact me to do some TV stuff, uh, voiceover stuff. Um, but that was it, really. I never really did much outside the confines of, of what I did. <clears throat> So towards the back end of the eighties and the house explosion into the nineties, yeah. Um, t- tell us about things that you remember back then about how, how it progressed and how the, the scene changed and the music. The music would have started to change, but the, I, I, the music don't, I don't see changed. you. I don't see you supporting <clears throat> some of that music as it changed into the nineties and it and it got a little bit noisier, a little bit faster. Well, <clears throat> I mean, there's there's always the you know the wonderful world of hindsight, and I think. When I first went on the Big Beat, um, it was Acid House. Acid House was around. Um, but it was a different Acid House. It was a yeah, it was slower, a, a sexier, more soulful yeah. Acid House. Yeah, it was. But some of the house records that were around, um, I either should have played and I didn't, or I should have played more and I didn't. I think one of the one of the things that I got wrong about the Big Beat is I got, into that area where I got confused between the fact that I was doing a um, a radio show for club music and not just a radio show. So there were a couple of things that I didn't play because I'm thinking, God, that will sound awful on the radio. And that was that was wrong. That was wrong. Anything on my spring part. to mind? Lil Louis. Oh, really? French Kiss? Yeah. yeah. Okay. I never played French Kiss from start to finish. I mean, for a start, they had a problem with the bit in the middle where it slowed down. Mm-hmm. And I thought, am I going to be able to play this at all? And because after nine o'clock, which was the classic uh, watershed. line, yeah, yeah, watershed, um, I would then start playing hip hop. So at nine o'clock, I didn't want to play eight minutes of Little Louie or something, you know. So there was, there, were, there was the odd record like that that I should have played more of and didn't. And... The same with some of the other things as the music progressed. The other thing that happened before the end of the Big Beat, which was at the end of 91, some of the indie bands, of course, are very, very influenced by dance. You know, you've got the Mondays and all these guys going to the Hacienda and you've got the farm in Liverpool and all this kind of thing. Mm-hmm. And all of a sudden, some of the bands are starting to do dance records, really. And... I should have played things like Fool's Gold and stuff like that, which I didn't do. Um, so, yeah, I can look back, and, and they were the mistakes, I think, that I made where I didn't go with certain genres or didn't go with certain records that I could easily have have gone with and nobody would have batted an eyelid, really, because that's the way the whole thing was going. You know, clubs were opening up. Again, genre-wise, they were taking in more records from, from uh, more areas, if you like, and um, yeah, that that didn't. I, d- I didn't. I didn't embrace it like I should have done. Really. Okay. Did you ever get any negative feedback from from punters? No, no, I didn't really. Um, I used to get some shitty letters from some of the boys that listened to the hip hop hour. <laughs> but, really? Say yeah, what? Yeah. Say what? Saying, what the fuck are you playing that for? You know, it's like. So yeah, I mean, but no, that was it. I mean, generally. Um, no, but why? It, it, that it wasn't underground enough or they didn't know what it was? No, or? they d- either, either – I remember some kid from Oxford writing to me quite a lot and he was he kept <laughs> having a pop if I played something too often or something, you know, because there was only an hour, so, you know, uh-huh. you had a lot to feel. But, yeah, I mean, ge- generally it was okay. Again, some of the criticism – again, I only really found out about it later on and I'd find out about it on threads on Facebook or something, someone would bring something up and some bloke would go, oh, he never did this and he never did that. And I thought, well, actually, he's right, you know. Mm-hmm. So, how yeah. Did the, how does that make you feel? Um, I'm not, okay, I haven't got the skin of a rhino, but if if it's if it's criticism that's um, pretty good criticism, yeah, I'll, I'll take it, uh, which is why I've been able to look back I've read some of his stuff and I've looked back and thought about what I was doing. I thought, hmm, he was right about that because maybe I should have done this or maybe I should have done that. Um, so, yeah, yeah, there's um, – Well, if, you, if yeah, you've got their I'm names – I'm quite if okay. If you've got their names, send it our way, mate. We'll, yeah. we'll, we'll send the boys around. <laughs> <laughs> Don't worry, I've binned all the letters. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. So so into the 90s then. So, the, so as time progressed and uh, you say 91 – the uh, big beats 
and Ed was, was that was that your decision? Yeah, it was my decision. I mean, basically, um, I was ill. I was trying to do too much, and in October '91, uh, I was quite ill, and um, I managed to stay on air. But in those days, Radio One gave you a three month contract, and I was one week into a three month contract. So I went in to see Johnny Bailey and I said, look, I can't do any more. Um, I want to leave at the end of the year, at the end of the contract. And basically what I decided to do was to choose record companies over DJing. Uh, I was still very, very heavily involved at MCA, uh, sorry, A&M, and um, something had to give. And and so I decided it was... Um, it was going to be DJing. I also had a bit of a dichotomy um, because of some of the things we've just mentioned. I knew I had to do something about the program and I wasn't quite sure what. Um, the, the whole idea of having a program that was multi-genre was not going to work for much longer. I needed to change it. Uh, a fair amount of the house music that was around at that time, I didn't really like it. I still preferred hip-hop. And I thought, this isn't going to work. And like I say, I was ill. I was trying to do too much on my own. I didn't have any support. Um, and so I decided that I would pack it up. For some strange reason, when I started at Radio 1, I thought I'd probably only have a shelf life of four years anyway. I don't know why I thought that, but I just did. And so I lasted three years, three months, basically. Uh -huh. um, so, yeah, that's that's what happened. And that that was... The, uh, the background to the decision that I made. Okay. And did you, was it your decision to pass the baton onto Tongue? Because I know you and Pete shared the same management, right? At, at some yeah. Point. Did that, that, had no, that, had no, that had nothing, nothing to, do to do with it at all. Nothing okay. to do with it at all. Basically, Pete and I had been mates for years by then. And um, <clears throat> when uh, I was on Radio London, Pete was on Radio Kent. And I got the Radio 1 job and I said to the Radio 1 people, well, look, you know what, you better just get Pete Tong up from Radio Kent. So Tong goes on to Radio London. I go on to Radio 1. Um, because I resigned from Capital before I'd even started, the guys at Capital said to me, well, look, if you're not going to go, if you're not going to do this, what, what do we do? And I said, get Pete Tong. So boom. Next thing, Pete did six weeks on Radio London and he found himself on Capital. So when I said to Johnny Beerling, I'm going to resign, well, I'm resigning, I'm out of here, I've got the classic, well, what do you think I should do? And I said, get Pete Tong off Capital. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, he's still there. <laughs> so, um, yeah, that's that. there's somebody else out there that might have a different version of that, but that's my version and I'm sticking well, that, to it. That's from the horse's mouth, so it doesn't get more authentic than that. Yeah, uh, yeah. And so obviously the way that you tell, the way that you, you recite those memories, they're all filled with with fun, fun memories, right? You had a great time yeah. there. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I think with Radio 1, when I first went there, um, I was a bit overwhelmed in a way. I mean, although people, I mean, if I mention people like Simon Bates and some of these other characters, people probably go, oh, Jesus, wept. But whatever you think of them, they were masters of the microphone. They were masters of their jobs. And, um, you know, they had such power and high profile at, at the um, at the radio station. But after a little while, after about three or four months of piss taking over the things I used to stay on air, um, I suddenly tumbled that these blokes can't do what I do and I can't do what they do and that's fine by me i'm very happy doing what i'm doing in the way that i'm doing it there's no one else up here that can do this so i'll just get on with the job back back then that the, you know it was a completely different um the house music and that the, you know the pop culture was so different yeah. so i'm not sure if you ever you ever would have been called out to any of the road shows was, oh was no, too no, early no. For that? no 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 I don't think I was roadshow material anyway. I think I would have, if ever I'd got asked, God forbid, I'd have pushed back on that really, really hard. I just your mullet, your mullet wasn't long enough. Oh, <laughs> just 
I mean, when I was a kid and I used to listen to Radio 1, the road show would come on and I'd go, oh, I can't listen to this shit. And I'd turn it off <laughs> until the road show was finished and then I'd turn it back on again, you know. Um, but, yeah, yeah, I was, I was never going to do that. I mean, but I did things. You helped things. check. I'm, Sorry, carry on, carry on. Well, I was going to say, I did things that, um, you know, you kind of had to do, like you would do the Radio 1 Christmas party and you'd do the team photo and all this kind of stuff, you know. Um and that was fine. That was fine. But I was never going to get asked to do some of those things that were really the domain of the of the mainstays of the station. You know, whether it was Bates or Steve Wright or Gary Davis or or you know whoever. They were all nice people. No problem at all. They were all great. And um, but and we used to laugh and joke about you know what I did and you know I used to go into Wrighty's studio after he'd finished every Friday and we we'd always sit around and chat and have a laugh about things and you know and then he, he would go off and i'd get myself ready for the for the show and stuff you know it was it was all right it was okay it's it's really difficult to kind of paint a picture in your mind back then how long ago it was you know the iconic building and as you say all of those characters they were, yeah you know as big as the kardashians are today in, in yeah area, i know, you know? I, I mean i do remember one moment in the early days when i was there uh, I went in on a Saturday for some reason and I went down to the studios and DLT was on and he's sitting there and he's wearing a tweed jacket and a hat and he's smoking a pipe. And I remember looking through the glass thinking, fucking hell, if people could see this, surely they wouldn't be having it, you know. It's just like, oh, yeah. So when they had to clear out, it was inevitable what was going to happen. So Yeah, most definitely. Well, that was, the, oh, again, I was going to talk about relevance to the scene and, and moving on. So when you handed out the show over, so did you take a complete downtime or you, you just focused purely on the, on the labels? Okay, well, yeah, I, I focused on the labels. I very quickly moved to MCA and um, I was there till 94, I think. And um, I came out of MCA and I was at a bit of a loose end. And um, at that point, uh, for quite a long time, I'd been using a studio for mastering and stuff called Masterpiece. And uh, the guy who owned it at the time asked me if I would like to come in with it. So around 94, maybe 95, I think it was 94, I went into Masterpiece. Um, I had a little management company for a while. Uh, that we ran out of masterpiece, and um, who was on the uh, roster? <clears throat> oh my word! It was um, people like. It's really funny. My missus showed me a bit of paper yesterday with the bloody roster on it. I can't remember it. So it was Uno, Cleo, Bump, um, a couple of engineers, a New Zealand guy called um, uh, Dave. Something, but he was he was an utter genius behind the boards. But he went back to New Zealand. We had a we had a vocal coach on the yeah. roster. Um, we never managed any artists. It was all kind of DJs and and we did voiceover stuff for people like Trevor Nelson. Took care of that. Um, so yeah, it was you know it was it was okay. That was good. Um, and you know working at Masterpiece, I really enjoyed because artists would come in and. You know, it's it's as close as I could get to being in the creative arena, seeing all that stuff come about. And so that that was really, really good. And then in 95, he called me and said, look, Matthew Bannister wants more dance programs. You know, will you will you join a company with us? We want you to be the, the chat between us and the BBC because you are a BBC bloke. So they'll feel comfortable working with you. And and it worked quite well. And and this kind of came about because Bannister kept asking Pete to do more, but he couldn't do any more because of his work with London Records. You know, I think, you know, you work for a major label and do a radio show, there's only so much you can do. So our way around it was to say to Matthew, look, we'll form a company and we'll give you shows. So in the early days, Eddie Gordon had already come up with the Essential Mix, so that was ours. Um and we had Danny Rampling on the air. We introduced them to Westwood. And later on, we had Jules on there as well. Um, we could have taken Fabio and Groove Rider, but 
I wasn't comfortable with it. I didn't think it was going to work. And Radio One just took them anyway. So that was great. Um, we tried to get them to take Giles and they didn't, but then eventually they did off their own back without us. Um, so it was good. And, and after a year, I think we'd only been going a year and we said to them, we should do a show from Ibiza. And, um, they kind of went, hmm, that's interesting. And obviously Ibiza was, you know. So you, you definitely, you, you always wanted that road show, you see, and you find Yeah, yeah, it. yeah. <laughs> with, with me standing at the back with a stopwatch, yeah, yeah. So, um, so we went and did a recce. Um, it was quite a funny story, actually. We went and did a recce uh, in Ibiza, and we took a BBC engineer with us. And... Um, we went off to Cafe Del Mar and we looked around and, and the idea was we would use ISDN, which is a line, to send the programs back to um, uh, London so they could then be broadcast. And um, after uh, then, we, then we looked at amnesia and what we could do at amnesia and then we went to have a meeting with this bloke from Ibiza Spanish Telecom. And we're sitting in this office. He's got some fan going in the corner, blah, 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 all this. And we have a chat with him. And to put it mildly, he wasn't very convincing. You know, he's going, oh, yeah, we'll put an ISDN line in there. And we're going, yeah, yeah, but this is the date. Oh, yeah, yeah, no problem, no problem. So we walk out, shut the door, and the BBC engineer says to me, no fucking way. <laughs> so, so, God bless them, they worked out a whole new regime and they drove two satellite trucks from London to Ibiza, stuck one in the car park of Amnesia and one at Cafe Del Mar, pointed these things skywards, and we we did a broad, we did our broadcast via satellite. Oh, was it at Del Mar? I always saw it always we did, off we did, Mambo. We did, no, no, we started off at Del Mar. Okay. Because in well, those days, sense, we had a, really. yeah, we had a relationship with Jose Padilla, of course, and, you know, all that sort of stuff. So, um, yeah, and then, so that was Danny, P, Jules, I think, uh, might have come that first year. Then year two, we bolted on Dave Pierce. And then year three, they went mental and took everybody from the station, everybody, Moyles, Zoe Ball, this yeah. person, that producer, da-da-da. And, and we were saying, I was saying to everyone, you really don't need to do this. And he's like, no, 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 we want to do it, we want to do it. And, of course, that was the year they lost Lisa Ianson. She went to the Manumission Hotel and no no one saw her for a day and a half. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone seen Lisa? Yeah, and so, yeah, yeah. But So that was down to us. And, of course, they're still going, you know, they're still going out to Ibiza. It's a, it's a pivotal weekend for them every year. Well, and other radio right. stations did it as well. You know, other yeah, radio they, stations would they, do it. Yeah. Well, that's definitely groundbreaking, definitely set the blueprint for, for many others to follow. And uh, when I had started promoting this conversation, I had billed it as, you know, definitely uh, one of the UK's house music's most influential people. And my friend Steve said, oh, Jeff, so much more than just house music. I said, yeah, I, I understand that. I know that most of the people will know that, but I also don't know if some people will be fully aware of your involvement. So I'm glad we got that. You know, yeah. that's that story out there. That I part mean with of the story. With Danny, for example, when Danny first went on Radio One, I was on KISS. So I'd do some kind of KISS chart show on a Saturday morning, then I'd record a Sunday oldies show, and then I'd fly up to Radio One and produce Danny's show. I did that for a while and then um uh, our friend Lewis Dean and, and our other friend Darren Carrington, they did it, they both did it until Danny left. Um but yeah, yeah, I was I was in there doing various programs and things. So, um, yeah, I mean, I had a bit of experience, so I could pass that on, you know. And, and then some. And then yeah. some. So the passage of time and the the, the scene just went, went absolutely uh, insane, right? Yeah. Blew up, as you say, with the extent that Radio 1 got involved and then the, the music and the, the, the trance explosion and, and, and so on and so forth. And then yeah. um, I think, who was it who – do you remember who used to do the show – um, and they used to narrate over the top of music, or I might be getting confused with Galaxy. Actually, ignore that. Sorry, okay. on, my brain, okay. my brain just went off on a tangent. I mean, um, one, of, one of the things I would say quickly is um, where you were saying about music and clubs. 
you know, once we'd started our various programs through our production companies uh, from the Beeb and we had the essential mix, we then started to go to a club once a month and broadcast live. So that was good. So that brought very, very up-to-date club culture into people's rooms, as well as having great mixes by great guys who Pete and Eddie were choosing. Um, you know, there are some very very pivotal pieces of work out there that that were debuted on the, on the essential mix. Uh, and then that'll, that'll take us in, into the, the two thousands too, too many um, twists and turns to, as I keep saying, to document them all. But uh, tell us about where you think you feel is an important part of your, your progression changed. And at some point, when did you step away from the labels? Cause that happened, right? Well, yeah, I stepped away from the labels in 94 and, and then I was saying I got involved with Masterpiece. So I was helping to run Masterpiece on a daily basis. Oh, okay, um, right. Forgive me. Yeah. yeah. So I, we, we had the production company. Uh, I was working on Kiss, uh, just doing a couple of shows at the weekend for Gordon Mack. And then out of the blue, um, 10 years after I'd stood him up, Richard Park came back for me and I ended up leaving Kiss and going to Capital. And I did a year there, um, which again was was very successful. Um, the ratings were fantastic. Um, I don't think the Radio One people were very impressed because I was going up against Danny, who in, in theory uh, was a program being delivered by my own company. Um, but it was it was kind of difficult because you know I got offered the capital job and Pete and Ed were kind of like oh, you can't really do that, and I'm like you know what, you blokes can go gallivanting around doing what you like, and yet I can't. And mm-hmm. it's like, you know what, I'm going to do it. So I went and did it. It probably didn't help the company. In fact, I know it didn't help the company. But, um, yeah, I, I did that. And it was yeah another thing that I started from scratch, and it was really, really successful. It was a shame it only lasted a year. Um, Parky wanted to try something else in that slot. He instead of embracing something that was fresh of his own, he wanted something that was closer to what another station was doing so he could go after their ratings. So that was why he took me off. So, you know, it was okay. It was one of those things that stuff like that happens. And it was at that point that I said, right, that's it now. Enough. I'm definitely out of here now. Um, And that was around 2000. And and that was when I had the uh, the long break, um, the very long break. But I think um, I was able I was able to use the experience I gained from all the jobs. So, for example, you know when you're in A and R, you're you're working with different artists, different genres, different personalities, different needs. So when I was in a, a different situation where you were dealing with an artist. You were used to dealing with that artist. You weren't necessarily overawed or, and you know, you treat them respectfully. And sometimes you might drop a hint about what you'd done before. And they go, Oh, you did that. And they, and they kind of might feel a bit safer for whatever reason. Mm-hmm. Um, and you know, when, when I'm working in radio, I'm using my own experience to, to try and help things along. Um, yeah, all, all of these things. It's, it, Because I did so many things, I was able to bring quite a lot of experience into different arenas. And um, I think that always worked for me. And I always tried to be civil to people as well. You know, I didn't, I couldn't do that arsehole thing, you know. And I think, um, I think people, you know, respected me for that, um, which I think was, you know, worthwhile. A bit like in the old days when Chris and Robbie go, oh, work with him, he won't stitch you up. You know, it's like, yeah, I've always tried to do that. Um, uh, well, it's definitely it's definitely stood you in good stead. Um, I had meant to ask at the very beginning, and I didn't. Go on. Um, were you ever completely um, starstruck with anyone that you met along the way? Any were you sort of like taken well, out of your comfort zone? Well, um, I mean, I did I did meet an, an awful lot of people where you would be sitting there going, "Jesus Christ, I'm sitting with so and so," but. Um, I never found myself in a situation where I just sit there with my gob open, you know. Um, you know, I had a, I, I had a, a um, I had a thing with Mark Knopfler once where he asked me to help him place a song, 
And I just wasn't, you know, when we were talking, I wasn't overawed. Uh, I mean, the best one was the, is the Stevie Wonder story. Um, I was working with uh, Keith Harris, who's who's a really well known uh, manager. You know, all kind. You know, he's done all kinds of things in the record business, and he managed um, acts like Junior and other UK soul acts. But he also uh, works with Stevie Wonder, and um, he was a bit like Stevie's gatekeeper. You know, he would make sure you know some of the band aren't buying flowers on his account and stuff like that. You know, he was very much into taking care of Stephen. When Steve came to Europe, he um, he used to look after Steve. You know, he was his he was Stevie's man basically. And I was working with Keith on a couple of things at the time. And out of the blue, he said to me, "Would you like to sign Stevie Wonder's label?" And I thought, you know, that's a that's the thing. And I, of course, I said, "Yeah, bloody hellfire, of course I would." And he said, "Okay, well, we'll uh, we'll see what we can do." So a little while later, Stevie's in London, and the phone goes, and it's my man Keith. And he goes, "Look, Steve's in. He wants to come and say hello." So I said, yeah, fine. So um, if Stevie Wonder comes to our office with two of his blokes, and he sits in an office with me and my boss at the time, and I think there was a third one, third person as well, and he sits and. And he plays the songs from this piece of recording equipment that he'd made, he'd written in his room that morning. And it was all like, wow, this is fantastic. And we're chatting away to him about different things. And he's going, yeah, I, I, I want to have this record label. I, I keep coming across all this talent and um, I want to I want to put some of their records out. So off he goes. And then I have to start going to Los Angeles to see him and I would go out there and, it, and I'd ring up various people at the studio and go, what's happening? They're like, well, we'll call you when he's, when he's going to come down. And, of course, he works on wonder time. He works when he wakes up and nobody knows when that's going to be. So you could be in the hotel. It could be three in the morning. The phone would go. Steve's coming down. Get down here now. So he jump in the car and go to one. <laughs> as you would, go to Wonderland, sit there. In comes Steve, and you know you chat and you you do this, and it was it was fantastic, and I was never overawed because he was such a he was such a great bloke. It was really really funny, um, amazing talent. Um, his engineer played me a couple of tracks on the album he was recording at the time, and that was that was pretty amazing. But then the the, the end of the story was we couldn't get the deal signed. No one seemed to want to sign it. And in the end, business affairs at Phonogram said to me, go to LA and get this bloody deal done. And I'm like, fine, I'll go off. So I go to LA and I read his lawyer, who was another eccentric character, but an amazing bloke. And he says, listen, I need to meet you. I said, okay, where do you want to meet? And he gives me an address and it's a car park, right? And it's not a nice multi-story car park. It's a piece of waste ground with some cars on it. Why? Wow, it I sounds like something off the wire. I <laughs> know. Oh, I turn up. He turns up in his beaten up old Stingray that he used to drive around in, and he gets out of the car, and we explain, uh, exchange pleasantries, and he said to me, listen, we're not signing this deal. And I said, okay, why aren't we signing this deal? And he said, because I know what Stevie's like, and – if he signs this deal, he'll spend all his money on it, and I can't allow that to happen. And I kind of went, oh, okay, well, I can't really argue with that. And we shook hands, and that was that. My chance to work with Stevie Wonder ended up on a piece of waste ground in Los Angeles. Could have been so a lot worse. <laughs> it could have been a lot worse. <laughs> but the moral of the story is, again, I, I was never overawed or sat there with my gob open thinking, what do I say to this bloke, you know? Mm-hmm. I've always been kind of relaxed around them. I mean, obviously, you're a bit twitchy if they're awkward. You know, I've interviewed a couple of people on the radio where you're you're very close to saying, listen, you know what? You don't want a beer. Why don't you go shopping? You know, but you kind of hold on and you get through it or whatever. I mean, I've, I've known many of radio people that have ended up with an, with an artist who obviously doesn't want to be there and they've got rid of them off. Get out, you know. Um, well, actually, Jeff, funny you yeah. say that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you, enough already. Yeah. I'll, I'll sit and listen all night. So, listen, um, I did say, you know, we, we, we can have a nice chat and we still yeah. got a little bit left. I, I shan't keep you much longer. 
I, I do want to find out you was, you were talking about then in the the turn of the two thousands then when you had the downtime and clubbing actually going out and doing gigs long since not happened. Every, everything everything stopped. Everything stopped after the um, after the capital thing. Mm-hmm. I did XFM for a year. That was a disaster. Um, on my own admission. Why, why, why was that a disaster? It just didn't, it didn't work for me. They, um, the people at Capital had bought XFM and they wanted to do it a certain way. Uh, and the, the template for it was quite a successful Australian radio station. And um, we, di- we did it and it didn't it didn't work very well for me at all. It just wasn't the way that I work. Um, I was okay with the music again because of this wide kind of background thing that I had. Even though they were playing the odd record by the Beastie Boys or whatever, you know. Um, but yeah, it was a disaster. So after a year, uh, that was over, and that was when I took the break. I took the break after the uh, the year on XFM. Um, so, uh, what yeah. what did the break consist of? What was life like for you on a day to day? Well, for the first time ever, it meant I only had one job, which was a bit of a, an interesting experience. I just concentrated solely on uh, running masterpiece, uh, and it was good. I had I had time to to do things that I'd never had time to do before, um, and it was a it was a decent break. You know, I was still in touch with everybody. Um, so I was still kind of, I, I still kind of knew what was going on everywhere and stuff, but yeah, I just wasn't, uh, involved in it myself anymore. My time had come, you know, um, I was always on the edge of the old school and the new school, you know, in some respects I was, you know, going back in the day, I was kind of looked upon as being in the Chris and Robbie camp when really I was probably felt that I was more in the Pete Tong camp, you know, the, of the, of the young gun. So I was kind of in no man's land. Is that and when it, when it, maybe because of the, the age thing, possibly? Yeah, it could be, could be, could be the age thing. And then it was the same with the gig thing. You know, I, I never got asked to do things in London. It was always out of town. There's nothing wrong with that. But again, it was people's perception of me, maybe, um, which was fine. You know, that was okay. But yeah, after after the XFM thing, I thought I, thought I was kind of done by then. Okay. Um, so yeah, yeah, that was when... Um, I forget how many years it was. It was probably about 10, probably had a break for 10 years. Um, well, I forgot all about the masterpiece things. I've got many of the dub plates. Floating yeah, around I'm here. sure there are guys out there that have got a lot of dub plates. Or, you know, the other thing is to look in the runout groove. A lot of the engineers would sign their name in the runout groove. So it would be Wally at Masterpiece or blue, Neil blue at label, Masterpiece. Blue label, I think. Oh, uh, yeah, it was a blue, blue and white thing, yeah. Yeah, blue and white thing, different types of sleeve, some cardboard, some just bright white, you know. So, uh, so yeah, we so were the whole, So the whole landscape, the music landscape, had changed in this in this time as well with the advent of the MP3 and digital downloads oh, yeah. and everything like that, you know. So, yeah. so what what happened to 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 drag you back in? Then what was the t- you know? well? Okay, again, um, <laughs> I was fishing, and the phone went. Actually, and, um, sorry, hold that thought there. Yeah. I'm so sorry. In all of this time, being one of the most important men on the, on the you know, the UK music scene, are you still yeah. getting inundated with music all the time? Are you still going through all of this music? or uh, just... n- Not really. At that point, I mean, I, I have to be really honest, for the best part of 10 years, I was listening to Café Del Mar albums. Okay. You know, I wasn't really that in touch. And... um when it changed, this is where I ended up going to Jazz FM, you know, on that kind of, on that scene that was coming out of Jazz FM, if you like, you know, it was all about Mario Biondi and um, uh, Nicola Conte and all this sort of thing. I didn't have a single piece of music by those people, none of it. It was it was all rediscovery. So I'm fishing and I get a call, I answer it, and it's Mike Vitti from Jazz FM saying, you know, Robbie's not that well. He needs a couple of months off. Would you come in and and do a couple of months? So I did three and a half months of Sundays for Robbie. He he got himself fit and came back. And instead of binning me off, Jazz FM said, you don't fancy doing this, do you? You don't fancy doing that. And so from going there for like three months, I ended up doing 10 years. 
so um, I'd done various shows, normally Saturdays, Sundays. Um, I had my own Saturday show, my own Sunday show, and then eventually Robbie uh, gave up his Sunday show and they gave it to me. And that would have been nine years ago now, uh, and I did seven. I did seven years of that, and it was a f- the four-hour show from 10 in the morning to 2 in the afternoon. Oh, you and did do four hours. You weren't moaning about four hours this time. <laughs> no, no, not quite, not quite. So it was a whole – what was great about it was – I hadn't been in my regular room for 10 years. I didn't have a clue what was going on, and I'm suddenly back on the radio. So all of a sudden, um, back in the record shops, I'm back in my record room. I'm finding things in my record room I never knew I had, and I'm like, oh, this is quite handy, where I just accumulated stuff and never threw anything out. And um, as time went by, I, I pretty much caught up quickly with what was going on and who was doing what, and... As the seven years progress, you know, social media progresses and more and more people can just find you. You don't necessarily need a plugger or to stick a CD in a post. You can just contact someone directly and go, hey, can I send you my music? Have you heard this? And so the access became much easier um, because people just threw tons of stuff at you uh, online. Mm -hmm. And it was then just about, the time it took to go through it all and find out what was working for you and what wasn't. Um, And yeah, I'm I'm, I'm playing it. Um, And I think, you know, as I developed the Jazz FM show, probably 50% of it was new music, which is enough, I think, uh, for a program like that. It wasn't like the old days where you could go on and play two or three hours of new stuff. You know, I need to pepper it with some things that give people a little bit of a memory jolt or um, play something that they might have forgotten from an album or something. Um, but, yeah, the focus for me was was presenting the new music and, and putting new artists across the people. Mm-hmm. I, I think you've it's very clear you've got complete confidence in your own musical knowledge and your ability. So there was never a point when you went back second-guessing second guessing if, if things were, were right. Yeah, I I, um, I was always pretty confident, particularly with the radio. Um, I mean, there was a, there was a point where um, a particular jazz FM show came up for not for grabs, it's the wrong word. It came up basically, and um, I kind of half heartedly put myself forward, and they gave it to somebody else, which I was quite relieved about actually, because on the high, you know when I thought about it, the Sunday show was taking up so much time to take another show on would have been ridiculous, and. You know, when I when I put myself forward, I said to the, the the head of jazz at the time, I said, "Listen, I've always, whenever I've done a program for somebody where I choose the music, I always give you numbers. Always, I've never done something where when I've chosen the music, it's failed. So I'm just going to leave that with you." And he gave it to somebody else. So I was like, "Okay, fine." But yeah, <laughs> yeah. So. Uh, yeah, again, I, you know, life's too short. I can't be getting, you know, hit up about things like that. But I was really happy with the Sunday show because it worked really, really well. Well, I, I know from experience because I reached out to you out of the blue and, and asked, would you care to come and join us in Spain? Uh, yeah. And I remember having the conversation. Uh, so you were obviously doing little bits of work back on the club circuit by then? Yeah, or, yeah. Or... I, I was doing little bits and pieces. I mean, basically, when I went on jazz in 2010, in early 2011, they, they asked me to do a couple of gigs at their Ronnie Scott's night. And um, so I, me and Anne went up to Ronnie's a couple of times and, and stood there and watched what goes on. And then I thought, okay, well, I think I can deal with this. And because um, I hadn't done a gig for 10 years. And I was also wise enough to know I couldn't go up there with a box, the same box of records I was carrying around 10 years ago because that was never going to work. So... I kind of did a few gigs at Ronnie's and then of course the word goes out, Oh, he's doing gigs. And then people start to call and it was great. It was very, very flattering. Um, I think again, uh, I was able to look back on it and, and say that it took me a year before I thought I knew what I was doing again. I think in the early days I thought I knew what I was doing, but I I didn't really, you know, it, it was it certainly wasn't like riding a bike um but a year on i I was getting quite confident and 
getting a better feel for what I should and shouldn't be playing. And I think I think I got better. Um, but what was interesting about your thing, of course, is you asked me to do the Radio 1 thing, which nobody had ever asked me to do. Well, uh, yeah, so, I reached out and said, Vocal Booth Weekend, uh, we would love you, I would love you to please come and share some of that incredible music that you educated us all on. And you yeah. were a little taken aback, right? Yeah, I was, yeah. I, 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 again, I find it flattering. And like I said, I was quite shocked because nobody had ever asked me to do that. In fact, I, thought, I don't know if you remember this, but I think an hour before I went on, I was still saying to you, are you sure you want me to do this? And you're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Go on, get up there, do it, do it. And I'm like, okay, all right. And it was great. I really enjoyed it. I really enjoyed it. I think a lot of people enjoyed it as well. So that oh, was really and good. Some. And then yeah, some, I, I love the experience because obviously it was the first time I'd been to VB and I thought it was fabulous. And I'm not, I'm not having a pop at the people I used to play to, but it was great working with a generation younger, if you see what I mean. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that was really nice. And so the music was a bit different as well from what I was used to hearing at gigs that I was going out to myself. And I loved, I loved VB. I thought it was fabulous. And I loved it the second time I came back as well, the, yeah. the bloody year of the flood, yeah. The year so, of the uh, rains. And we yeah, loved, know, we loved having what a, you. And, what and a I shock that was for you. Yeah. Oh, yeah, we dealt with it. DJP was in here early. I'm sure he's still watching. Uh, had you at yeah. Camp Soul as well. I know you Yeah, yeah, that. yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay, so then slowly but surely you decide that, okay, I've, I've had enough now. <laughs> Yeah, well, I, I, I mean, the way it came about was when we went into lockdown, the first lockdown, um, it didn't take me long to realise that I wasn't missing the gigs. And I thought, mm, this isn't right. You know, if I'm not missing it, I shouldn't be doing it and, you know, whatever, whatever. So I kind of had it in my mind I was going to slip out of the gigs. And then I think in year two of lockdown and everything else, the whole the, the Jazz FM programme began – to be so much work it was it was restricting i was supposed to be retired and i was spending two whole days on the show that doesn't sound a lot but i you know i'd be in my room here at 8 30 in the morning i'd come out at 10 o'clock at night but then i'd be doing something on a monday uh, a friday and a sunday so uh, not all day but a chunk of the day will be dedicated to do something to do with that program and I and I thought I can't be doing this, and it's four hours, and it's really really long, and I wanted to do all these things, and so I thought, okay, I, I need to stop this. So I think we were in lockdown number three, and it was October, and um, what I decided to do, I thought we were going to get locked down again over the winter, so I thought, well, I might as well do this over the winter, and then retire at the end of March when spring comes, and I can move on into a fresh new summer, being properly, properly retired. And um, so that's what I did. If the Jazz FM show hadn't taken so long, you know what I might have done? I might have kept it going. I don't know. If they just said to me, oh, would you do two hours and let it go out in the middle of the night? I might have said yes. I don't know. But it doesn't matter because it didn't happen. So, yeah, and that was when I decided I was, I was properly done. I mean, again, you know, I'm 68 in a couple of months. And sometimes I think, you know, time's up. You know, I, I really admire some of the guys that are still going and, and still want to do it with massive, massive enthusiasm. I really admire all these guys that have got shows on the web and they're, you know, they're putting things together and they're doing it because they absolutely love it. I've got absolute admiration for all of those people. But just for me, I've got other things that I, that I want to move on and do. And I want to do it while I'm still fit enough and healthy enough to, to be able to do that. Well, you definitely gave your all while you were flying high at the top of the game throughout. I don't think anybody will ever, ever question that of you, of your services to music. Um, I mean, talking for the last 90 minutes, we have got a, a, an overview of everything that Jeff Young has been about, but there is still so much more. Has anybody ever approached you and, and talked about you know, getting deeper books or, you know, your yeah. own biopics and <laughs> so on and so forth. Okay. Well, I am, um, well, okay. First of all, I did get an approach about trying to put together a proper jazz funk documentary, which nobody has done really. 
there's plenty of documentaries about Northern Soul, the rave scene, maybe the house scene, but that whole jazz front arena has never been properly explored, I don't think. Mm-hmm. Um, we tr- we tried, we did some shooting, we did some research, and we thought we, we're never going to get this over the line. So we stopped. Um, pe- a couple of people said to me about a book, but I don't think my story is interesting enough to do a book. Um, and I think it might be too confusing because I led this double life, you know, sort of record company and then studio owner um, alongside all this DJ and stuff as well. And how I've often wondered if I did attempt it, how I would um, put the book together so that the story flowed but without people going, well, where is he now? What's he doing now? Now he seems to be doing this, you know. So, yeah, because I jumped around quite a bit with it in my career, I um, I thought, I don't know. There are, yeah, and I've read a few of those DJ books that are out there, and some of them aren't, aren't that impressive, and I don't want to be one of them. <laughs> I doubt that would be the case. Well, you've done an incredible job this evening of painting the picture. And as I say, you know, just, just a few of the little bullet points along the way of an illustrious career, um, a gentleman that is so highly revered by anybody that you ask. I don't think there will be many people that would have a bad word to say about you. Is that correct? Um, would you, well, would you again, like to think that? Again, that's very kind of you. Would, Thank would you. you agree? Or you think? Well, actually, yeah, I mean, there are a few people out there that don't like me. I know that, but you know what? Generally, I think I've done a decent job. You've done, you've done an absolute incredible job. I could quite easily sit here talking to you all evening, but I would like to um, keep it on a high and just thank you so much for your time. Uh, again, I said at the beginning, I'll say it again at the end. I wanted to lay it on thick of just how important you have been in my own personal career. Well, uh, thank in, you. Uh, you know, we've turning me on to the love of this music and uh, it was an honor to you know to get you and to call you a friend and to have have this conversation with you and i'm sure everybody watching this will echo those thoughts so okay well, thank well you thanks time, my friend my pleasure too thank you very much brilliant i will leave it there i will bid you farewell i'm just going to say a few words okay. i always say when i finish the conversation i'll press a button it will unceremoniously kick you off of zoom enjoy okay. the rest of tuesday thank take you care. cheers take care man wow uh Incredible, incredible. What am I doing? Where am I looking? Yeah. Uh, Please leave a comment if you are coming back and watching the recording. People in the chat have been uh, leaving some nice words for Jeff. I am uh, really at a loss as what else I can say. Thank you to everyone that's been commenting. John, sorry I didn't say hi to you earlier. Thank you. Thank you, Julie. Thank you, Tommy. Um, And Simon says it was an honour to have served with you. Some interesting words there from Mr. Jeff Young. Okay, on the screen, just a little bit of information. You see all of the fancy graphics that we have when I'm doing the show. Uh, This forthcoming Saturday, I've got one space left on an OBS workshop that I'm doing. You can find out all about that at djandywood.net. I don't really want to talk about it now after such an incredible conversation. Um, I'll say again, please do leave a comment for Jeff. Let him know what you thought of that. And uh, if you've enjoyed these conversations, do take a look on the wall of the YouTube channel, because down the last two years, I have spoken to some truly, truly inspirational, influential, motivational humans, and uh, you may find something else of interest. Thank you all for your comments. Thank you for being here. I will press this button and I will say next week on the show, I'll be back again and I'll have details to share. If you've recently subscribed to the channel, thank you very much. And on the right-hand side, you can see all of my Access crew who help bring this show to you on a weekly basis. Thank you so much, guys. Enjoy the rest of your evening.